today we're here to talk about digital laboratory accreditation. And um, I'm here representing the Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations and ASCLAD, the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors, where I sit on the board of directors. And we are a proud co-sponsor of this event. So we, we thank you for allowing us to participate here. Because of uh, early on a show of hands, I wanted to take a little bit of a step back and talk about accreditation and what it is. So accreditation is when a laboratory looks at international standards or national standards and adheres to those standards. And generally there's some kind of an inspection that goes along with that. There's generally self uh, declarations of things that they're doing. Generally it refers to the management system of the laboratory and how they're complying with standards and protocols. Generally, it requires that laboratories have protocols that they're following, and the audits are assessing them to those protocols. I would say that the forensic community is uh, largely in support of accreditation of all disciplines, and um, ASCLAD as an organization has, has uh, been at the forefront of accreditation for a long time. In fact, ASCLAD Lab, which is the Laboratory Accreditation Board, um, now uh, known as ANAB or ASCLAD Lab, um, they were a, a group that formed out of, out of ASCLAD early on. So the majority of the full service, I'll say full service crime laboratories in the country, ones that are larger state laboratories, uh, large local laboratories are accredited uh, by and large. And there are um, different definitions of what a laboratory is. So we have to be careful how we define that. But again, a lot of laboratories in the country are. Now, when we get to digital evidence, there are several different types of services being offered. So there's more investiga investigatory type um, services being offered, and then there's also laboratory services that are being offered. And we'll talk a little bit about that on this panel today. Now, most, most of the digital evidence labs are not part of traditional laboratories, except for maybe on the federal level, which our first speaker will talk about. But I think that would be the case on the state and local level. Now, the, the National Commission on Forensic Science has, has made a lot of uh, recommendations on accreditation. The December 2015, the Attorney General uh, made recommendations and made a, a recommendation on accreditation, uh, but that recommendation excluded digital evidence laboratories. In February of this year, there was a draft circulated from the National Commission, and it's called the Recommendation for Accreditation of Digital and Multimedia Forensic Science Service Providers, and they made five recommendations. So what we looked at was the comments that were coming back on this document, and they were very divided. And so we sought to get a, a wide panel of thought on this issue, uh, some that are pro, some that are, are not so pro on accreditation, we also look to represent the federal laboratories, uh, state, local interests. So we wanted to go for a very wide perspective. We reached out to experts on the OSAC and other experts in the community, and, and we have a very distinguished panel I'm excited to say today. We'll start with uh, Risa Gilliland, and I will read her, her bio here, and I apologize because uh, my email, speaking of the digital evidence panel, is malfunctioning. So here we go. Um, so, Risa Gilliland is the Assistant Laboratory Director for the Forensic Laboratory Services at the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. She began her career in 1988 as a forensic chemist in the DEA Northwest Laboratory and later became a supervisor in the forensic chemist at the DEA Mid-Atlantic Laboratory, a program manager with the DEA Office of Forensic Sciences, and ended her, career, her DEA career as the laboratory director of the DEA Digital Evidence Laboratory. In 2011, she entered her current position with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. She directly oversees two laboratory unit managers who in turn supervise 21 forensic computer analysts at 20 digital evidence laboratories throughout the country. Ms. Gilliland received a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Nebraska Wesleyan University in 1983 and a Master's of Forensic Science from the University of New Haven in 1988. She is a member of ASCLAD, current section chair in the Digital and Multimedia section of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, current vice chair of the ASTM 30 Committee on Forensic Sciences, current chair of the ASTM 30.12 subcommittee, Digital and, and Multimedia Sciences, and certified in ISO IEC 17025 uh, as an assessor for ASCLAD Lab. We'll let Risa go, and I'll introduce the others as we present. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. 
All right, everyone's had food, so I'm trying to try and not let you get too sleepy on me, okay? Um, Matt did a very good job put it right in. So basically, I came to the Postal Inspection Service. Patricia Manzalillo is the lab director there, and she had just inherited 18 digital evidence units, most of them one-person laboratories or units, and wanted to get them accredited. So she knew I had done it at DEA, and she called me asking for someone who might know, I might know that would be good at this. So I sat there racking my brain trying to figure out who would be good for this, and my secretary walked in and said, well, why aren't you considering it? And I'm like, huh, maybe I should. It'd be a nicer commute. So needless to say, it was the best move I've made. <laughs> Very happy over there. Um, we've acquired two more locations. And actually, since I wrote that bio, we are now also going to be entering into the cyber world and assisting, have three additional positions and going to start posting in cyber forensics. So I have something else to work on. But anyway, right now I have 20 digital evidence units that are throughout the big cities of the US. All became accredited late in 2014 and the latter two became accredited in 2015. So a um, lot of work ahead, but done now it's just maintaining. So talked about this already. Um, when I was at DEA, we went through two rounds of ISO accreditation through ASCLED Lab and then another round at Inspection Service. So I'm pretty familiar with the ASCLED Lab process and the policies and procedures that need to be in place and how to track them and satisfy those assessors when they come through looking for everything. And my background in digital evidence is that since 1997 when I got tasked to help them figure out how to come up with a budget on acquiring their equipment and coming up with that with DEA. So that was back when they provided their findings in reams of paper, boxes of paper printed out on the roll spoked printers. Yeah, we've come a long way since there. <laughs> All right, so why should we go for accreditation? Well, I guess the biggest thing to me is to have an outside entity that can come in and look and assess you against a level of criteria. And with ASCLAD Lab, it's not only the ISO 17025, it's also their own internal um, documentation that they have, their supplemental standards, which are important because ISO doesn't cover the true forensic stuff. Like, are we do it, handling our evidence properly? Is it secured properly? That type of stuff. Are we being safe and, and managing our environment? That type of stuff is not necessarily touched on in the true ISO world. So we. I have a tendency to like the ASCLED lab way of doing things because that's what we're familiar with. Um, it also provides validation of the, the work performed meets industry standards. Now, one of the things we're finding is, a, is a difficult in the digital forensics world is we don't have industry standards out there. We have best practices, but there's not a level of minimum level of expectations that's put out there. So putting on my other hat up from ASTM, I would dearly love to help get those in place, but it's a slow process and we're working on it. Um, the, one of the tenets of, of accreditation is to constantly look at yourself and what your operations are, constant improvement, looking to see how you can do better at what you do and the information you provide to your customer. Well, for us, the customer is not just the postal inspector, but it's also the court system. It's also the attorneys. It's who else is involved in the process of the case that we are doing the evidence for. So we want to look at the evidence. We want to make sure we're doing the best we can, analyzing it and providing the information that we find. So constantly looking at ourselves to make sure that we're doing the best we can is innate in the ISO process. It's constantly, you do an annual review of yourself, you go and look to see if you're following all your own policies, you look to see whether you're meeting all of those standards. And in the process, you realize whether, oops, we let this slide, we need to write ourselves up, and we need to get back on the track, or maybe we're not doing something as efficient or as best we can, and then we think of ways that we can go forward and improve the process. So that's the biggest goal that I can find from us that the accreditation has forced us to do that we may not have done without being accredited. And probably the most arduous task in the whole thing is the documentation. Because with accreditation, unless you've got a piece of paper, it didn't happen. So you can say you're doing it, and you can interview someone that says they're doing it, but that's not good enough. You actually need to go and look at their notes. You need to look at the documentation that you have maintained to prove that you're doing what you say you're doing. And if you don't have that in place, 
you're only you're giving lip service to whoever's asking you the question. So accreditation has also forced us to get better at documenting and ensuring we have that documentation. Okay, issue with accreditation. People start writing policy to the nth degree of minutia on exactly how you must do the work. That's probably the worst thing you can do because if you don't write your policy and standards, you have to write them to satisfy the criteria, but you need to write them so you have enough latitude to actually do the examination that you need to do. So when I was at DEA, we first came up with, I didn't have methods. I had a list of this is the equipment that's used and tested. Here is a list of software we use and no works. The analyst goes forward and, and comes up with their analysis. Well, the assessors couldn't wrap their head around that because most of them were too new at this and thought that you gotta have a method, you gotta have a step-by-step -step process. And I'm like, no, because you don't know what you're getting in digital forensics until you start the work and you actually see what you've got. So I realized when I came to inspection service that that wasn't gonna fly. So I basically came up with high level, um, global level things that I would expect an examiner to do and then give a lot of wriggle room. If necessary, the following should be done. And document it that way so it gives the analyst enough latitude to actually do the work that they need to do, but still document it and have it there for the assessors to actually see, did you do all this? So that was something that I had to be very careful of and, uh, and have learned over the years of what's how best to write policy to become accredited. Um, things you have to figure out along the way. Technical reviews, admin reviews. Okay, technical reviews in the ASLAT environment is basically the same as a peer review. Basically someone that can do the same work that your analyst is doing, they need to review their work product and their process that they did with their documented notes and see if they would have come up with the same conclusion or same if they would have done the same thing. That's what a peer, peer review or technical review is. Now, being an accredited laboratory, you have to have someone that's an accredited laboratory do the review. So in our laboratory, 21 person laboratories, thankfully we have everything digitized. So they go into our system, they log on, they review everything there, and now we just, as of this Tuesday, yeah, June 1st, we now have a WebEx availability in our policy that as long as they see, can watch someone put the disk in to another computer and watch them click on the links and see what the format of everything is, they've done the review of the findings disk. It doesn't actually have to be mailed or shipped anywhere. And that's been working really well for us. And so it's, it's, it is a hump or a, a hurdle you have to get over, but if somebody else in the neighborhood or even nearby is accredited, you can share tech reviewing. You know, we only have, a, in the forensic lab, we only have a, one person that's cleared to do audio analysis. So everything that he does, we have to coordinate with someone else from an accredited laboratory to assist in doing his tech reviews. And you just work it out. Um, when I first got to inspection service, the digital labs were doing everything in paper still. And they had this wonderful LIM system, or DIMS is what we call it, that allowed you to upload documents. I'm like, what are we doing here? You're mailing the, fo you're mailing the case folders around? What happens if it gets lost in the mail? <laughs> what then? And I'm like, we have this capability. Why are we doing this? You know, heaven forbid Mother Postal, they're fine, they're wonderful, but things happen. And so now we scan everything in, upload it, and it's available for anyone to look at. And if we need to provide it for, um, for defense or for anyone in the court, we can print it out and provide a hard copy of it, or we can burn it to a disk. So we've got the best of worlds by doing everything electronic. If you wanna do paper, that's your choice. I mean, you can do it however it is, but don't, you know, the key about this is where you keep everything and keeping it current. So the other thing about your policy is you can't have multiple versions of policy out there. So you gotta make sure that that doesn't happen. And basically why over and over again are we doing this? Constantly explain to the staff that this is important. Yes, it's something that, that will be a feather in our cap when we get there. Some people will never understand why we're doing it. That's your choice on how you wanna view it. But I think I, I've felt it's very important. It has improved the quality of the work of my unit. It has done, brought them a better level of understanding of what's needed in the culture. And the argument we were fine before, well, that doesn't wash because the world changes. And we can't always do the same thing we've always done before. That doesn't work. How often has your phone had to be upgraded? It works differently too. So everything changes. And it's taking me away from casework. Well, maybe, 
for a while until you get good at it, then it doesn't take you away too long. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for giving me the time. Appreciate the opportunity. And I'm sure we'll have questions later. Our next, our next presenter is John Duckworth. John is an 18-year law enforcement veteran with experience in local, state, and federal investigative agencies. He's a seasoned cyber crime and computer intrusion investigator and has over 10 years experience conducting forensic examinations in support of complex investigations into a broad variety of crimes, including homicides, computer hacking, and international trafficking in stolen credit cards. He has managed computer crime units and has testified as an expert an expert witness regarding digital evidence and computer forensics. John is currently a special agent with the U.S. Postal Service Office of Inspector General and sits on the Forensics Committee for the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. Please welcome uh, John Duckworth. So I'm going to assume that you guys have seen enough slides with bullets on them, so I'll <laughs> Uh, over the course of the day, so I'll spare you that. Um, like Matt said, I've uh, been in law enforcement for a number of years. Um, uh, started out as a state police trooper, uh, spent some time there, did 10 years with the Secret Service, where I started my career in cyber crime investigations and computer forensics, and uh, now I'm at the OIG, which is very often confused with the inspection service, um, which is okay, because we're all part of the same big happy family. Um, the distinction being that the inspection service is an internal component of the postal service, and the OIG is the external watchdog group uh, tasked with investigation, fraud, waste, and abuse kind of things. So you might say we inspect the inspectors. Uh, so um, in, in the last three years as well, I've had some forays into the private sector uh, doing computer forensics for some litigation support as well as uh, incident response, intrusion response, hacking response. Um, and for all the reasons that Risa gave, I'm somewhat opposed to the idea of accreditation, at least as the way it's instantiated now. Um, we have a, a paucity of good standards or any standards that specifically apply to the domain of computer forensics. Um, and what we've seen over the last several years is an attempt to shoehorn uh, standards that were written for calibration and testing labs and medical laboratories onto uh, digital forensics. And in order to make them applicable or understandable to the digital forensic community, they often have to be massaged with crosswalk documents and interpretations in order to make them seem relevant to what we do. Uh, another reason that I, I don't feel that accreditation is really the best place to focus our resources at this time is the, is the fast change of the technology. Um, you know, as Risa mentioned, your phone, the day you buy it, it's obsolete. And the day that your run-of-the-mill criminal's phone gets seized by the police to examine is the day after it got updated and the tools that we had last week to examine that and rip data or find evidence on it are no longer functional. And the churn and the rapid pace of improvements and updates and tool development cycles keeps us from uh, getting locked in. Uh, to go through an entire reaccreditation for every version of a tool is a very cumbersome product process and can add a lot of time on to what are oftentimes very uh, pressing critical investigations that they, they can't uh, you know, survive any more undue delay. Uh, we find that the accreditation process is, is somewhat overburdensome. A lot of the components of accreditation that are designed around ensuring the proper processes and procedures are followed in medical and calibration and testing labs are already a very big part of the law enforcement evidence um, processing environment that, that we work within. We already know about chain of custody and, and, and tracking of evidence and secure storage and these things and to impose additional standards on something, it gets very redundant. Uh, when we have backlogs of cases that are three and six months at a time, and our examiners are working constantly through a, an ever-growing uh, backlog to pull individuals off of that to generate the necessary documentation and policy to align with an accreditation standard is, is not something we can often afford to, uh, to invest in at the expense of ongoing investigations. 
Um, I'll, I'll touch on this generally because it, it, it or briefly because it applies to the work I've done in in, in uh, small uh, local forensic labs is that the accreditation process can be very very cost prohibitive to labs who the only capability they have is is something that arose from a grant from a federal agency to send an examiner to training and give him equipment to do a baseline uh, to give him a baseline capability to triage and, and do baseline initial forensic review of seized evidence and smaller sheriff's offices smaller police departments can do themselves a lot of favor by getting this work done at the local level in-house with these types of grants from the Secret Services uh, Computer Forensic Training Institute and DOJ grants to the FBI. They can train and equip their guys to do the local grassroots kind of work for their cases to move them to the next step without having to rely on the larger state and federal labs as, or like the RCFLs that the FBI has, uh, regional labs. Um, to burden them with the cost of paying an assessor and to have ASCLAD lab come out, these costs add into the tens of thousands of dollars occasionally and they become prohibitive. And if local labs, local agencies don't have the funding to even barely get one examiner trained and certified and competent, then they're not gonna have the money to this and they're gonna to do the accreditation as well and they're gonna just close up shop. Um, and, and finally, what I, one of the things I have a big issue with is that accreditation seems to me as a the seeding of what should be a public regulatory authority to private organizations. ASCLAD and ISO and ASTM and ANSI are, if not for profit, they are at least profit um, motivated or cost motivated organizations that don't answer to the taxpayer, they don't answer to the judiciary, they don't answer to, the, to our legislature. And by putting our standards development, our uh, process regulation in their hands, we cede some, some influence and control over that to bodies that are based outside the United States that don't necessarily have the best interests of our, um, of our process in mind. Um, I've not ever done criminal defense work. Um, I have colleagues who have. And if we're going to propose legislation or regulation that would require even defense work that's going to be submitted as exhibits in court, um, you, you kind of exclude a large body of practicing examiners from that kind of work if they don't belong to a, a larger um, accredited organization. Uh, and, and we're you know, on both sides, it hurts on both sides, from from the police investigative side as well as as the defense side. So, with that, I'll uh, I'll pass the mic back and talk to you. Uh, Thanks, John. Sure. Our next presenter will be Troy Lawrence. Troy is a 28-year veteran of the Fort Worth Police Department in Texas. He began his forensic career in in 2000 while assigned as a as a vice enforcement officer. He started in the digital forensics lab in 2004 and has seen it grow from a one-man shop into six full-time dedicated examiners, expanding to nine examiners later this year. He now supervises this unit as a sergeant and he will bring to us the, the local perspective on, on accreditation. So please welcome Troy Lawrence. Where's the presentation here? Hello, I was uh, asked to come here to be the voice of reason. Uh, I come from the state and local perspective. Um, I am a practicing digital forensic examiner. I'm gonna do this different than everybody else. I'm gonna ask you guys questions in this presentation. I want you to, to answer back to me. Obviously, you're going to see the light as we, uh, we just saw with the, with the shades going up here. Brief introduction about myself. I am 28 year experience uh, investigator with the uh, Fort Worth Police Department. I began my career in forensics in 2000. Um, just fell into it because I was the only officer that had a computer at home. <laughs> I was the most qualified. That's the way it goes at a lot of state and, police, state and local police departments. You rely on the talent you have. We can't go out and hire people 
to come in as specialists because they don't have the budgets. So I, uh, I went to training after my first case was kicked back from the DA's office saying, you can't boot the bad guy's computer and find out what was on it. You have to make a copy of the hard drive. You have to, who'd ever heard of that? We hadn't. And I'm sure much of the police department, or many of the police departments around the country are the same way. The field has grown substantially. I, I got my certification uh, from IASIS, which is a nonprofit organization, international organization. Since then, I've actually joined the board of directors. I am the uh, director of training internationally. I was teaching in New Zealand earlier this year, and uh, it was beautiful. If you get a chance to go down there, go down there. We expanded from a single man shop, which I was, to we're going to have nine officers in the lab as of uh, later this fall. It's already been budgeted. We're hiring three more examiners. So we are considered a big lab in the state and local realms. Most of your departments have one and two man shops, one and two person shops. Is everybody here from New York? Is there anybody from Texas? OK, it's not completely a hostile crowd. <laughs> There's a couple of friends here, so bail me out here, okay? We are trying to put digital evidence, a square peg, into a round hole for accreditation. And it doesn't work. It may work for some of the large federal agencies, but it doesn't work for your one and two men shops in the state and local level. First, we need to ask, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Have there been scandals where digital evidence has been practiced or handled improperly? Has it been put in the media? Does anybody know of cases other than Casey Anthony where they, they gave an improper result? Are there any other substantial cases that are in the media? Do we have ways of settling these? Do you have remedies in the, as attorneys? Do you have remedies for bad evidence? Can it be excluded at the court level? No. no? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Not a very good attorney if you can't get the evidence excluded. <laughs> but the introduction of it, don't we have steps like Daubert that we have to qualify to get this evidence into court? No. There are such qualifications they don't lose. Okay. Is there a wide a, a sweeping trend that digital evidence is being handled improperly by examiners? Yes, sir. It wasn't a sweeping trend in hair evidence was being handled improperly by examiners either. So I don't know when the evidence the evidence for coming in for 20 years, somebody says, Jesus, this wasn't really handled properly. I'm not sure that that's the same thing. I think in the next slide you'll see it's a, it's a message of appearance. It's, we we want to start to try to solve the problem. In 2009, the uh, NAS report came out. Is everybody familiar with NAS, NAS? They want to strengthen forensic sciences, and they, they're going for accreditation and certifications of individuals. Well, we argued for a long time, by gosh, we're a, we're a science. Well, now we're being held to that. Okay, if you're a science, go get accredited like all the other sciences. I argue that we aren't doing a science. We are street cops who are copying hard drives and we're doing an investigation into the data that was on that computer. We're not doing a science, we're doing an investigation, like going through file cabinets of a business. We're looking for evidence of the crime. What educational requirements are there? You can have a one officer at a department in an accredited lab that can go to a one-week class and he is now a forensic expert. Does that make him a scientist? No, it doesn't make him a scientist. You don't have to have a college degree to do computer forensics. You don't have to have a basis in science. You just have, I have a degree in marketing. Am I a scientist? I argue not, but I could testify that the evidence that I found uh, was actually on the hard drive and I've been declared an expert in several trials. Um, currently, the labs are not doing an improper job. Um, if they were, would any of these mistakes have been fixed if they were accredited? Yes, sir. Accreditation is about a quality system. Right. So the concept is that your quality system is going to pick these things up. Right. But I will, I will address that further later on in the speech, but I, I've got a, a solution to that that doesn't require accreditation. Well, 
by the way, yes. Good, good, good. <laughs> Are you from Texas? Yeah, oh. <laughs> we do have openings, you can move. <laughs> and there's no state income tax. And there's no state income tax. Now to my UT fan, my daughter's here with me. She came for the trip. She's going to the University of Oklahoma, so. <laughs> So do we have remedies? I argue that we do have some remedies, and the, the courts have the ability to exclude the evidence if they want to. Okay, we, we'll disagree. I think a good synopsis of why we have a push for accreditation is based, do you all know that ASCLAD and ANAB, they merged, right? About a month, two months ago? What's and, ADAB? pardon me? What's ADAB? It's another accrediting body, like ASCLAD. So you've got ASCLAD as one accrediting body, you've got A2LA as another accrediting body, you've got a, uh, ANAB that's another accrediting body. ANAB and ASCLAD joined together about a month ago. And in their merge, they had a, freak, a FAQ statement that came out. And in their document they said that they, by combining these, these organizations that they will increase the confidence that the public has doesn't mean that they're going to increase the science, they're going to increase the confidence. It's a perception issue. They're only seeking to increase the perception. How are they going to do that? Currently there are four sub-disciplines inside uh, ASCLAD labs for digital evidence. There's computer forensics, there's forensic video, image analysis, and forensic audio. So keep those four ideas in mind. Computer forensics, <coughs> Forensic video, which is a video analysis. Image analysis, which is comparing pictures. Um, and forensic audio, which is the, the audio side of it. An automobile crash or airplane crash. If, if you're going to go plug into the, the crashed vehicle, is that now digital evidence? Does that have to be done in the accredited lab now? Because we're, if we say that all evidence, all digital evidence must be processed in an accredited lab, can the traffic unit not go down and plug in the the device into the cars and download the data from the crash system. Our airplane black boxes now gonna have to be done only in accredited labs because it is a digital evidence. Cyber attacks, if, if uh, Sony gets hacked again, are the investigators gonna have to be ASCLAD accredited or A2LA accredited so that they can go investigate this hacking? It's digital evidence. Mobile phones, a lot of departments have devices that they can download phones at the patrol officer level with proper legal authority, but they can download that data. If we say that, that cell phones are digital evidence and all digital evidence must be done in an accredited lab, you get rid of all of that and you, it all goes into the backlog of regional computer forensic labs that are accredited. <coughs> Think about the delay. Officer worn body cams, is that now digital evidence? Does that have to go through our labs? We're all being mandated to wear these cameras now in our uniforms. A home DVR or a security system on a house, does that now have to go through the lab? If a, if a victim gets a threatening email, can that victim not give that email to the detective? It is a digital piece of evidence. Does it have to go through the lab to get processed before we can work on it? Our crime scene officers that photograph scenes are those digital photos now digital evidence. Have they got to be processed through the lab? If we broaden, or if we say all digital evidence has to be done through an accredited lab, we're killing ourselves. What are the positives of accreditation? It will force departments to have written documentation, quality manuals, management systems. It makes them have policies. That is great, they should all have them anyway. It will mandate that the departments provide funding to their examiners so that they can get trained. Most officers ha have to pay for the training themselves at the small departments. I've spent a lot of money going to different training out of my own pocket because my department wouldn't fund it. And it does give the appearance of quality work. But just because you're an accredited lab does not mean you're doing good work inside that lab. What are the negatives? If I'm a one-man shop in Podunk, Texas, and I have to have my work all peer-reviewed 100% of the time, who's going to peer-review my work in my department? Nobody. There's nobody qualified. So I'm gonna to have to send it to an, another lab who has different policies and procedures and different requirements so that they can review my work before I can give it back to my officer. 
Every cell phone is going to have to be done that way to give the data back to the detectives. If it's a child pornography investigation, how am I going to put that child pornography to that detective? Do I do it electronically? Just put it in Dropbox? Because we don't have an infrastructure between police departments. So the peer review process for one-man shops is nearly impossible unless we put it in a box, mail it, or we start this new WebEx, and we, we review it via WebEx, which is a, a, a third-party commercial tool or commercial uh, program to where you can kind of like Skype back and forth if you don't know what WebEx is, meetings online. Mandatory accreditation does not provide for universal training or standardized training or certification. It doesn't make your examiners any better from one lab to another. You determine what your policies are going to be. You determine what your training is going to be. It may increase public confidence, but they're getting a false sense of protection. There are 12,000 local police departments across the U.S. IASIS, the organization that I'm a member of, and I'm going to disclaim it here, I, I am a board of director member. <laughs> They have 1,900 current certified examiners around the world. 500 of them are single examiners at police departments. They're the only examiner at that department. And the majority of the uh, police departments have less than 300 officers, and they have one or two people that do the forensic examinations. Now, one of the fallacies about accreditation solving all the problems is, is that the labs will write their own policies. Think about that. They're going to write their own policies. If they're already doing it badly, why are we going to let them write their policies and enforce that bad policy? There is no oversight to make sure you're doing it right. Personnel selection. I'm stuck with the 1,600 officers I have at my department. In fact, I'm limited to 175 because they have to be a detective rank. So I can't go out and get the best and brightest. I have to go with what I have. <laughs> that didn't come out right. <laughs> well, I think it did. That's how I got selected. <laughs> Remember, I'm the only one that had a computer. Yeah. Hi, Mom. <laughs> then we have the debate of sworn versus civilian. In a perfect world, I would love to have a whole bunch of civilian examiners with prior law enforcement experience. I think they make the best examiners. Um, because they have the investigative ability, plus they have the, uh, I don't have to worry about them promoting and going back to patrol. In my department, I promoted from detective to sergeant. I had to go back to patrol after 13 years of experience because that was the best place for me to review those accident reports. I've since been able to come back. Full-time versus part-time. A lot of departments only do it part-time. They have to carry casework and do forensics on the side. So if we're going to mandate accreditation, you're going to have a lot of these shops that are going to have to close down because they can't afford to pull the examiner to a full-time position. I kind of covered this earlier. We don't have the infrastructure, and the turnaround times are going to increase on the one-man shop peer reviews. Fewer departments, backlogs, backlogs will continue to grow, and we'll have an increased turnaround. I know we're doing uh, 600 cell phones a year in our department. And it's all we can do to keep up with that. We have about a 100 phone backlog right now. If we're going to mandate accreditation, it's, we're going to have to be doing phones for all the other departments around us. And the backlogs will just get to be so large that they won't submit them for exams anymore. The biggest part about the, the DOJ recommendations is while it's only written for federal agencies, it's going to be pushed down to all the state and locals. Because what the state and local legislatures see at the federal level, they're going to mimic and they're going to push for statewide accreditation. Just because the feds do it doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> they also mentioned in their five recommendations that they're going to withhold grants from agencies that don't get accredited. That's Big Brother pushing their weight around and, and shutting down the ICACs Internet Crimes Against Children units that don't want to play with the federal system or the federal rules. So how can we strengthen digital evidence? I think that's what we all want to know. Let's focus on minimum training standards. There are none. Every unit, every department, every lab can have their own training requirements. 
Let's get organizations together that come up with these minimum guidelines, have core competencies. Let's also focus on certifications. Let's make sure that the individual is not only trained, but they're capable of doing the work, not whether their lab met some accreditation standards. Are they going for certifications that are vendor neutral? Don't go to just the vendor training because they're teaching the tool. Teach the foundation behind the tool. Have your, publish, your, uh, your competencies published. Make sure that that certification is peer reviewed so that it's not a, a, a fly-by-night organization that gives out a certification. And make those people adhere to a code of conduct. And if they violate that code of conduct, revert the, revoke their certification. They won't be able to testify. We need to establish curriculum for undergraduate and graduate programs. Digital evidence has been around long enough. There are companies that, or universities out there that are teaching undergraduate and graduate degrees. Some of the people coming out, the students that are coming out now, don't even know how to image a hard drive, yet they have a, a master's degree in the digital evidence. I think that's absurd. We need to strengthen the Daubert requirements. I think that the, that might be one way to, that the legis legislature can help the judiciary in determining what gets let in and what doesn't. We need to focus on the individual performing the work, not the labs that, are, that they're working in or the building that they're working in. And I'll close with this. Um, well, I'll close with this. Would you pick a brain surgeon based on that doctor's qualifications and specialty or the hospital he's allowed to work in? Which is more important? Is it his skills or the building where he's working in? Both. <laughs> Pardon? If you, if you don't look at the hospital, you'll end up with MRSA. You could be the best yep. brain surgeon in the world, but if the hospital isn't properly accredited and handling it properly, you're going to end up with a mass reduction that's going to kill you, and it's nothing to do with your surgeon. So but if, but also, if you if you have a hospital that hires any doctor that comes in, he wouldn't be the best person to do your brain surgery. Both. 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 Realize that if you go with both for digital evidence, you're going to shut down about half your practitioners in the country because they cannot make the, the jump to accreditation. That's it. Thank you. That's right.